Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the last public debriefing of this year uh, with the outcomes of the 53rd Barrack Ordinary Meetings. We met in Prague, um, and before we go on on the presenting all the results uh, of our proceedings, um, I thought it would be good to also inform you that before we had the 53rd Ordinary Meetings, the day before there was also um, an annual meeting of the Eastern Partnership Regulators. These are Mol Moldova, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia and Ukraine. Those regulators, we met um, uh, with them, with uh, several partners from, uh, from BEREC and discussed things like uh, their mutual roaming arrangements and how we can assist them in improving their telco um, cooperation. Um, and they had their 10th year anniversary. So I was very happy to attend that meeting as well. Um, then I, um, this was a very special meeting uh, also because it was the first where we had physical attendance by our colleagues from NCEC, the Ukrainian uh, regulator, who told us about their um, developments of their network and their connectivity and pressed us and I'd like to repeat their request for assistance in keeping their networks up and running, which as you can imagine, their challenge has shifted from uh, pure repairing the damage in the regions formerly occupied by Russia into keeping the network up and running um, when you have no power grid. Um, so they are looking for lithium batteries as well as diesel generators to keep their network up and running even when the power is down. So this is how we started our 53rd plenary in Prague, as I said. Um, on today's order, um, we have, um, as we do traditionally, two blocks of presentations when you can ask any questions that you have at the end of the first part, which we will announce. And then maybe just one more item before I give the floor to our first uh, co-chairs. Maybe first a list of A items. Um, we at Barrack, as Barrack Heads have said that we would like to spend as much time as possible on the agenda for real discussions on the content and therefore we aim to have as many A items as possible. So these are things that we can adopt and approve without any discussion. And this is the list, which I think is a record list of 14, um, which is a wide variety on reports of the study visit we did to uh, the United States of America uh, in the autumn, as well as on a report, for example, on best practices for ensuring equivalence of access and choice for disabled end users. So these were already discussed at the level of content network, which is uh, our uh, medium level senior representatives earlier in November and we adopted all of these and these are all can all be found on the Barrick website. So for today we have a special focus of course on those things that have been approved um, after consultation or are now being published for consultation that we want to draw your special attention to. We start this presentation with the Open Internet Working Group and with us are Klaus and Veronique, with us online, who will uh, have a presentation on the Barrick opinion for the evaluation of the application of a regulation from 2015. Veronique, Klaus, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Good afternoon on behalf of the Open Internet Working Group. Uh, today, we inform you on the Barrack opinion for the evaluation of the application of the Open Internet Regulation. Next slide, please. The objective of this opinion is to provide mm. input to uh, the European Commission for its second report to the European Parliament and the Council on the review of the Open Internet Regulation. This uh, report of the Commission is due by 30th of April next year. Barak already issued a first opinion on this matter in uh, 2018 and therefore we have focused the second opinion on the past four years of applying the open internet regulation. 
For the preparation of this opinion, we have also considered additional clarity that was provided by the European Court of Justice in its four rulings issued in uh, 2020 and 2021. We have based our the, the opinion on Barak's experience with the application of the Open Internet Regulation and the Barak Open Internet Guidelines. In this context, it's relevant to notice also the importance of NRA collaboration, of sharing best practices and experiences and also information, and that also contributes to ensure a harmonized and consistent application of the open internet regulation. Finally, we took note of stakeholders' contributions to previous public consultations, such as the consultation on the report on the internet, internet ecosystem, as well as the updated open internet guidelines. We now present the key findings of two of the topics that are addressed in the opinion. Next slide, please. One of these topics is to understand how the ECJ rulings affected the market and end users. First of all, the ECJ judgments provided additional clarity in applying the open internet regulation and Barak updated its open internet guidelines accordingly. An updated version was published in June this year. To evaluate the impact of the rulings of the European Court of Justice, we carried out a data collection by means of an internal questionnaire. Based on the data collected, we observed that there is no zero rating in the market anymore in 11 member states. And we expect that this number is, will increase in the coming weeks. It can be observed that ISPs either already implemented or are in the process of implementing the judgments. And it is also expected that zero rating will be discontinued in most member states by the end of March next year. On another point also um, addressed by the rulings and clarified in the guidelines is regarding uh, zero rating while the commercial offering of zero rating is banned as a result of the clarification provided by the ECJ. Union and national legislators might make exceptions for zero rating applications for public interest. These could be based on Article 3.3a of the Open Internet Regulation. For instance, uh, could be uh, based on the provisions of public warning systems or the roaming regulation. And Barrick deems that the clarifications in its open internet guidelines are sufficient and sees no need to update the open internet regulation in relation to differentiated pricing practices. Next slide, please. Another topic is about 5G and the possibility to differentiate quality of service. This topic has been addressed by stakeholders in many instances. Therefore, we wanted to shed some light on this topic. Barrack is not aware of any concrete example given by stakeholders where the implementation of 5G technology as such would be impeded by the open internet regulation. As already expressed in its 2018 opinion, the Open Internet Regulation seems to be leaving room for the implementation of 5G technologies. We also noted that the Open Internet Regulation allows ISPs to differentiate the quality of service level of Internet Access Service subscriptions under certain conditions, as outlined on the slide. And the Open Internet Regulation also allows the provision of specialized services. In response to a request often made by stakeholders, we also clarified that no exempted permission is required for quality of service differentiated internet access service offers or specialized services as provided in uh, the guideline number 21. Next slide, please. 
To conclude, Barak considers that the open internet regulation works and continues to be fit for purpose, and therefore Barak sees no merit in changing the text of the open internet regulation. So that's it for my part, and I pass the floor to Joanna and Isa Elisabeth, the co-chairs of the Roaming Working Group. Many thanks, Veronique. Now we are going to present together with Elizabeth the retail roaming guidelines, which were updated uh, after the last plenary meeting. Uh, next slide, please. So let me first give you some insight about the procedure. We started um, in June and uh, uh, from June 2022 until August 22 uh, with a public consultation of the draft uh, revision of the guidelines. On the 1st of July of 2022, the regulation got into force and um, <clears throat> we received uh, 10 contributions during the public consultation. Two of them were confidential and based on the input we received, we, uh, we adopted the final text of our updated guidelines in mid-December. The guidelines are already published on the Weberic website and Elizabeth will continue with uh, the details on what has been changed from the previous version of the guidelines. Thank you, Anna. Uh, next slide, please. As uh, time is limited for today, I would suggest that I focus mainly on the things where we have changed the guidelines compared to the previous version that was sent for public consultation. First of all, uh, there is a change regarding the scope of the transparency measures. Um, there was a clarification that not all transparency measures um, apply to roaming outside the EU and non-terrestrial networks. Um, so the previous version contained um, that they apply and now we um, clarify that only certain measures apply also to non-terrestrial networks and to roaming outside the EU. Regarding the fair use policy guidelines, um, here I would like to uh, focus that, uh, uh, that we have received a lot of comments uh, from the stakeholders asking for changes uh, with regard to the fair use policies per se. However, as Barrick, we decided not to do major changes in this part of the document. Um, this was all, already a decision that we um, took before we um, started the public consultation, mainly because we expect that the European Commission next year comes up uh, with a review of the Commission implementing regulation and the fair use policy measures might change and then we anyway need to update this part of the guidelines anyways. But uh, we see that there was a need to change at least some parts, taking into account the comments we received. Um, and this mainly refers to the, um, that, the bar uh, that the fair use policies uh, can be extended in certain circumstances, we are ex which are exceptional circumstances. But this uh, needs to be done only if the customer makes a justified request. In the previous version, we had just request. However, the, the regulation actually has a stronger criteria, which is justified, and we added this to the guidelines here. With regard to the emergency uh, communication and emergency services, here we clarify that this chapter is about access to emergency services. Um, and we clarify in the guidelines again which types of access to emergency services must be free of charge, namely those that are mandated by the member states and are published in the BEREC database um, that is, I think, now in the meantime already online. Um, next slide, please. With regard to the transparency measures here, we again uh, received a number of comments. Um, and uh, a lot of them we try to take into account. Um, I would like to start with the machine-to-machine -machine tariffs here. Uh, operators asked for an exemption from the automatic message for emergency services. Um, this is something we took into account and uh, we agree that it does not make sense to send this automatic message to machine-to-machine -to -machine tariffs and therefore um, uh, clarify in the guidelines that these are exempted. Furthermore, uh, we also clarify which information has to be part of the welcome SMS, uh, mainly with regard to the emergency services. Um, and here we again mention that uh, those uh, emergency services that are mandated by the member states and are part of the database must be also included in the welcome SMS. 
We also clarify that the access to the website of the operators, this must include additional information about roaming services, must be free of charge. And here there were some comments um, that this could be a breach of the open internet regulation. Here we also clarify that this is not a breach or no violation of the open internet regulation, because if it's based on a specific law, there are always exemptions. And this is also clarified in the Barrick open internet guidelines. Um, then um, the transparency measures have been also updated uh, about the information that the, that the operator has to give customers, uh, reminding him about which tariffs are available and that even in case he has an alternative tariff, the customer can always switch back to the default tariff, which is Rome like at home. Here we had a period of six months as a reasonable interval. Um, operators complained that this is too often. Uh, we agree that uh, we have some room for flexibility here and we change this to 12 months. The last change on the uh, transparency measures was with regard to the cutoff mechanism. Um, this now with the new regulation applies also to non-terrestrial networks. Here operators commented that in certain cases this is not possible to provide the cutoff limit, namely then uh, when the non-terrestrial network doesn't allow for a real-time monitoring of the traffic. And here we uh, clarified that also that they have to provide the cutoff mechanism only in the case the visited and uh, the non-terrestrial visited networks allows it to do so. And the final um, changes are in the guidelines dealing with value added services. Um, here we clarify again that if a split charge of a value added services, so if the connection part and the service part cannot be splitted, um, then the regulation, does, the price regulation does not apply. Um, this has been clarified in the guidelines here more explicitly now. This was it from my side and I now hand over to Julia and Begonia. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good afternoon, everybody, on behalf of the Statistics and Indicators Working Group. Today, I'm going to present the follow-up done by the group on revenue indicators related to number-independent interpersonal communication services. Next slide, please. The Berberg report develops in two directions. On the one hand, we have the NICS providers and their business models the approach being centered on the role that the communications facility holds for the respective provider. And on the other hand, we have the possibilities for BAREC to help NRAs with getting in contact with the NICS providers for the fulfillment of their tasks. Next slide, please. Okay, so a bit of background information. First of all, just to, to say that the NICs that we refer to in the Barrack report concern the messaging and video or telephony applications, but for instance, we do not deal with email services. And just a reminder that last year, Barrack has been publishing um, a work on definitions regarding certain OTT services. And in the case of NICS, uh, we recommended at the time registered and active users, as well as specific usage metrics. However, no conclusion could be drawn on the NICS revenue metrics then. Nevertheless, these indicators proved to be of high importance for NRAs, and this was something that Barris was tasked to do during this year. As mentioned, besides the revenue metrics, the report looks into how BAREC can assist NRAs with their data collection practices in this incipient stage that we are in. Next slide, please. Now, having a look at the revenues relevance, because we believe that motivation is very important and that the BAREC proposals, um, I would like to first start to, with the reasoning behind. So why do we need uh, revenue data from NICS providers? Some of the main reasons concern understanding of the sector in general and of the electronic communications markets in particular, the assessment of competition dynamics, and here we can think both of number-based and number-independent communication services, the detection of emerging regulatory issues 
as well as the evaluation of the outcome of regulatory decisions and also performance of ex post assessment. And here we can think, for instance, of dispute resolutions. Coming to the typology that Barak is proposing in the report, we have two distinguishing elements. First is what we call the revenue generating unit, and this concerns essentially the end users. And we need this tool in order to be able to distinguish between revenue generating by the end user, so this revenue generating unit, uh, or direct revenues, and revenue generated by third parties or indirect revenues. And secondly, um, our typology um, is distinguished with the help of the role that the communications facility plays for the generation of revenues. So for instance, we have a look at whether the payment which take takes place is initiated or not in the NICS interface. On a separate note, but still related, we also mentioned the intangible value added that a communication service can have for the whole um, platform ecosystem. And here we talk about retention and lock-in effects, for instance. All these aspects have been discussed uh, with you essentially at the stakeholder stakeholder workshop which took place at the end of June in this year and also it's noteworthy that um, the discussion on the on the typologies that we propose in the Barrack report is seen in direct link with the tasks that the NRAs need to fulfill. Next slide please. Coming to the, the other main direction that the report develops, um, Section 3 presents an analysis of the possibilities that Barrack has for hosting a NICS provider's contact list for the use of NRAs. And we list uh, two main options. The first one is that Barrack collects a contact list from each NRA and keeps it updated. And of course, when the NRAs use it, this um, the use and the reasoning has to be argued for, but this would be something uh, for the fulfillment of the mission. And option two, that Barrack requests the NICS providers to voluntarily share their contact details. And this, by contrast with the first one, would be an option without the NRA's involvement. Barrack recommends option one. And also with Barrack, Barrack's involvement, we expect that more coordination and harmonization among NRAs um, concerning the data collection practices of NICS uh, develops over time. Next slide, please. So coming to the conclusions of our work. Um, as we've seen, the NICS data collection by NRAs is its, in its infancy. However, Barrack is to accompany the authorities throughout these new processes and to ensure that their experience is shared among countries so that all parties can benefit from it, including end users. This report reflects collectively on the need for NICS revenue data and also draws a correspondence between the relevant types of revenue and each major task. However, the decision on the data collection is left with the NRAs. And we also argue for more consultation with the stakeholders before final decisions are made. On the contact list, the practical details are to be developed in the um, future once the decision to set up this list is uh, undertaken by the BOR. And finally, um, the Barrack reports that we developed so far concentrate on present data needs but we do see a scope for extending needs for information in the future. And for instance, here we can think of the regulation of the digital um, sector purposes. And with this, I finish my presentation. I thank you for your attention and I hand over to uh, Chiara and Jorge, the co-chairs of the MIA Expert Working Group. Thank you, Julia. Good afternoon, everybody. So the idea first, we will present you our work 
on business services and the uh, regulation issues related to, to business services that we have done this year and the report that you see here that is open to public consultation. So if we move to the next slide. Uh, well, the report, uh, the idea for the report is to provide, as you see here, a snapshot on how we are regulating the wholesale markets that are related to retail business services, essentially, but not only market two, because market one, market three B is also used for business services, and as, as well as um, to, to highlight cases where regulation, symmetry regulation and physical infrastructure access is specifically considered for business services. So as told, the, the idea is to show there, I'm trying to go to the, to the detail on how we are all regulated, regulating these markets. So we have done that based in what we consider a comprehensive questionnaire that was responding by all Bered members plus six observers. So principally it's a very complete view. You have in the in the report in Annex One the, the, the questionnaire we use with uh, with NRAs. And the idea for the for the report apart from being useful for stakeholders and for us when regulating uh, the markets, is also to, to use it for our future public work in the context of business services. This will be done together with uh, the input we receive in the workshop with the stakeholders associations that we did in October uh, this year that we are very grateful on, on the associations or on the on the views provide. And an external study we commission on uh, to, to better understand especially the demand side. Uh, later on we will display on that explain on that. So if we move to the next slide. Yeah here you can see the issues we are addressing. Probably you have already taken a look to the to the report, we are addressing which are the retail markets that we analyze in the context of business services, how uh, the related wholesale markets are regulated, including market one and market three B. But in this case, instead of uh, just the regulation for mass market, is about what is specific for uh, business services. We have tried to pay the special attention to to that difference eh, in the in the reference offer on, on, on the obligations, etc., and the detail on the wholesale products considered as told when there are in race consider spe considering specific issues on, on symmetric regulation on passive infrastructure. Is there is a few on them, uh, but you have there. And we have also touched on data collection aspects, the, the, how we collect, how often, specific issues we, we address, etc. And good practice that can be useful for all of us to learn from each other. And as told, uh, we have a last chapter on, on ideas on future work where we would like to, to receive the input input from stakeholders, eh? because uh, the idea is to use this as a you know, roadmap on, on issues that we, we can address in the future. So if we move to the next slide. Here, you can see some data. Um, essentially, we are most of uh, the NRAs are regulating these, uh, these markets. We have seen that there are, I think there is no surprise, high incumbent market shares. In general, we ask for a qualitative analysis from uh, NRAs. It's not increasing, in some cases it's stable, in others it's being reduced, but it's still high. 
uh, I mean, on, on the differences between market one and um, market two, uh, we have seen that it is guaranteed symmetric bandwidth and especially SLAs uh, that are, you need more uh, SLAs in the case of business services. You have the details in the, in the report. Um, no surprise on that market one and market three B are used for small and medium enterprise. It is confirmed in the external report uh, we, we commissioned. Um, and then market two is typically a national scope and in general there is no segmentation on, on the speeds. Uh, here you can see that we have also useful information on good practices that could be applied in data in a race. And here you have um, one of the diagrams, uh, probably we have certainly the nicer one uh, with all the colors, etc. But, but here you can see that we have tried to go to, to, to the detail on the, the different products on how they are regulated uh, in terms of uh, um, price regulation. So we, we think that it can be useful for everybody. If we move to the next slide. Uh, here you have some lines on what we have already considered for uh, future work. Uh, for example, the evolution of competition dynamics can be especially interesting now that we are having um, a footprint of fever starting to have, uh, well, in some cases, uh, there is a complete, almost complete. Uh, fever footprint in, in the country. So it can change the, the competition dynamics with alternatives. And in the past, it was mainly focused on niche market um, players. Uh, one thing that we will, I think that next year we will start working on the competition and collaboration between electronic communication service providers and IT players because we have seen that more and more there's an increasing use of IT services, uh, many times sold bundle. Uh, so it's something interesting to be to be analyzed. Switching aspects, especially for large multi-site companies are still an issue that worth analyzing. And the fashion of uh, traditional these lines to, to explore in more detail how we are doing. Um, and then from each other. So next slide. A stall. Uh, we have opened it for our public consultation. You have already re the report there. It ends on 3rd February. So you have enough time to take your holidays and and, and provide your input. A stall it will be especially interesting on in, in future work. Um, and that's all about the report and only one slide, next slide, about another report we have published that is an external report we, we have commissioned to Decision and Cantar because we wanted to, to know directly, uh, not only from the demand side, but also from the offer side on, I mean, what are um, what business services are business users demanding, a characterization, um, how they contract, etc. And here you can see what we what they have done is phone service with companies of different sizes, is one dozen uh, service based on a questionnaire, and we have taken five large countries in in Europe uh, to get an idea on how things are evolving. We think that it's interesting not only for us but also for stakeholders, especially operators, etc. because it's really empirical evidence obtained uh, from the sources, from companies and it's, there is not so much information on, on that. Uh, sorry. Yeah, you can see the aspects we have covered. We, we we recommend you to take a look at least to the to the report because it can be useful for all of us. Um, and I think that with that next slide, I think that it's yeah, Chiara, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jose. Um, 
Yes, thanks a lot, Jorge. So on the first slide, we are presenting today uh, the internet, um, the, the report on the internet ecosystem. Um, we have already uh, presented this uh, report before when we opened it to public consultation. So today we will focus rather on the feedback that we received and how it was integrated. On the next slide, please. Okay, so just uh, to remind a bit the context of uh, this report, uh, the objective was uh, to describe how the internet ecosystem is affected by uh, some digital players and also their position, their role and the practices in terms of competition dynamics and also openness. And uh, of course, included in the openness also in, uh, user choice and also their, their experience. And uh, um, it, uh, the idea was also to create, to have a roadmap for issues uh, to be uh, studied and discussed by Beric in the future. So it was, uh, the idea was to have this uh, broad uh, analysis on the different elements of the ecosystem to identify potential issues that we would focus more on in, the in details in the future. The public consultation was open from uh, 14th of June until the 22nd of July and we received uh, very interesting responses. On the next slide, please. Uh, seven respondents and uh, um, what we really appreciated was that it was both from uh, operators and uh, also platforms so that we could enrich uh, the, the report with uh, the elements provided by both. So thank you very much to the stakeholders who replied. In general, it was uh, we received positive feedbacks and uh, useful insights also really on, on some details that we could uh, uh, feed our report with. Um, there were no major changes which were uh, requested by the, uh, by the stakeholders and uh, everything as usual is uh, explained uh, how it was treated in the, the report that we published at the same time on the summary of the responses and how Berek took it into account. On the next slide, please, we will have um, uh, an overview of the input and the adaptations. Um, so given the context in which this report was published, uh, we received uh, pretty some uh, um, responses which were uh, focusing on the sending party network pays uh, debate, uh, let's say the fair share debate. And in these cases, uh, this was out of the scope of the, the current report. But of course, what we did as Beric is that we took this, uh, we analyzed also these responses and which are treated and addressed in other work uh, done by Beric on the topic of uh, SBNP. Uh, we also received uh, useful uh, details about the services which were which are provided by the big tech companies, and uh, we integrated, of course, in the in the report, in especially in the chapter where we focus on all the services provided, and also some technical details and clarifications on different elements uh, like DNS, CDNs, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, this as well was integrated and adapted, of course, to the scope of the report. And uh, we also updated some of uh, the figures that we are uh, providing uh, to integrate the comments that we received. On the next slide, please. So as I said, this uh, report was used also as a, a roadmap for future work. Uh, so that's what, uh, what we did. Uh, we um, identified some uh, key topics that we could focus on. And uh, some of these topics are already included in the work program for 2023. Uh, for instance, the entry and presence of big tech companies in ECS and ECNs markets, and also the dynamics with uh, telco operators. And uh, we really want uh, uh, to identify a bit this uh, uh, competition or cooperation dynamics between uh, these uh, two uh, different types of actors. Um, and also the report on IP interconnection ecosystem is something which is foreseen for the work program to the, uh, 2023 and uh, the contribution uh, regarding the potential CAPS contribution to um, uh, network investments as well. And then there are other topics which are uh, which will only in part uh, be analyzed in a, a different uh, work in, in Beric for next year, but uh, can be also a roadmap for the future, which is devices, um, uh, virtual assistance, IoT, eSIMs, and uh, uh, different topics that you see on, on the screen. And also um, in this report, what we focused on was really the competition and the openness analysis. Uh, but of course, uh, there are also other aspects, for instance, concerning the environmental impact of the services which are provided, which are of interest uh, for Beric as well. 
Uh, and on this, I think I'm done on the internet ecosystem, so we can move to the next uh, uh, report, uh, which we are published today. In this case, it's a draft report uh, that we open to public consultation on the interoperability of mix of uh, num number independent interpersonal communication services. So we can go on the first slide. Uh, the context in this case is, uh, um, of course, it's very topical as well, uh, um, because now, uh, the, so some, uh, some weeks ago, the, the DMA entered into force on the 1st of November, and the DMA includes some obligations uh, for interoperability of NICS. These uh, obligations are also uh, in, the, in the code, in the ECC, under Article 61. And uh, um, for, for Beric, it was important to give this contribution uh, to in the, the context of uh, uh, the entry into force of the DMA and also the context of the implementation so of, uh, of this uh, new regulation, where the European Commission can also consult Beric, uh, especially concerning the uh, gatekeeper's preference offer uh, for uh, the, um, uh, the implementation of interoperability measures. Um, I will go to the, uh, to the context, um, content of the report, but just to remind you that in this case, uh, the public consultation is open until 27th of January, and we really welcome your, uh, your contributions on this. Uh, on the content, uh, so the idea is to uh, explore uh, the, the objectives, the scopes and the triggers of the interoperability under uh, these two, these two uh, regulatory frameworks, so the DMA and the ECC. Uh, we focused on the technical approaches which are um, which can be implemented and also some of the challenges that have to be taken into account. And uh, one point which is uh, uh, of course key is also the interplay between the, the two regulatory framework, uh, frameworks, so the ECC and the DMA, and uh, how they can work in a consistent manner. Uh, so we refer to NICS, uh, but as we uh, explicitly say also in the report for now, uh, the analysis is mainly focused on uh, messaging services, which does not mean that the other kind of NICS will not be analyzed in the future, for instance, a video conference, uh, uh, conference, video conference services. And um, uh, we also organized the workshops with experts uh, to, um, to enrich our report and to get their insights. And uh, we may also organize more in, uh, in the future before the publication of the final report. On the next slide, please. Uh, so, on the technical implementations, we have analyzed different solutions like APIs and bridges, and also the processes which are possible, like for instance, uh, uh, through formal standardization or not. And uh, we focus on different aspects like uh, functions, updating mechanisms, innovations, and so on. And we, we do, uh, of course, we analyze the two frameworks, regulatory frameworks separately. Uh, for the DMA, since there is the obligation to provide a, a reference offer by the gatekeepers, we also provide a first list of minimum criteria. Um, and for the ECC, there are uh, two conditions uh, which are uh, important for the application of Article 61, which is uh, that end-to-end -end connectivity uh, must be endangered, and also that the level of coverage and user uptake uh, must be considered as significant. So in this case, we uh, give some first insight on, insights on how these two um, conditions could be analyzed and uh, assessed. On the next slide, please. So, in the interplay, this is a key point uh, because as uh, a barrack, we will also be part of the high level group in the DMA. And uh, part of the mission of this group is also to ensure a uh, consistency between the DMA and other regulatory um, uh, frameworks. Um, and uh, so we, uh, we identify these uh, um, uh, provisions, uh, interoperability provisions, uh, as uh, complementary. And uh, the DMA will uh, very likely be applied first uh, because it's, uh, it will uh, follow the, the timing of the DMA, which has already entered into force. And uh, these uh, um, obligations do not need to be uh, assessed before being applied. They will apply uh, directly. Um, so the DMA will be applied first and uh, the ECC may still uh, be useful to complement uh, the, the provisions of the DMA since the conditions are different and also uh, the objectives that they, that they follow. And, uh, but we believe that uh, the similarities that we have in the governance uh, with the leading role of the European Commission and the involvement of BEREC in both frameworks will also help to ensure a consistency between uh, uh, these, two, um, these two regulations. 
Uh, next slide, and I think it, we are done. So just to remind you that it's uh, uh, until the 27th of uh, uh, January, the public consultation, and I give the floor back to Anne-Marie for the Q&A. Thank you, Chiara. And that concludes our first round of presentations. And I give the floor for questions. There are no questions online yet, so the floor may speak first. Luc, please go ahead. Yeah, th thank you very much, Anne Marie, and thank you all for those for those presentation and, and for the reports. I, so I have a question and, and, and I have a point that I wanted to make, and and I understand that this is all a lot of work and and that you are bound by the uh, uh, first uh, contact network meeting mid uh, of February. Uh, there are no four consultation with quite important topics, and there will be also uh, a, uh, a very important consultation coming or documents published by the European Commission, which make that there will be a lot, a lot to happen uh, beginning of the year or by the end of the year, and even unusually. So, as an association, four consultation uh, with the deadlines they have are highly problematic for us because we have to prepare, we draft ourselves, we have to check with our members. I think that we all. And if there is one that thinks it does not, does not deserve, please raise your hand. A, uh, deserve a, a good family a family time between Christmas and New Year. So that means that we are all out for two weeks. And so uh, I would really, really, really call for extension of those deadlines. Because uh, if we want to do quality work, it's just impossible for us to match that. Okay. On, on the second point, uh, it's a question on the business services. So thank you for the report and the explanation. So I will not re say all what we said during the, the workshop, but there is one specific question on the future works because uh, we are now more than 20 years after liberalization, those markets remain highly concentrated. Uh, and we see in the report what, what NRAs have done and how they regulate, but I do not see and, and, and what are the plans uh, of the action to remedy of the situation that has not changed for more than 20 years, because that's really the point now. Those markets remain concentrated. What, what are the works done by Berek? Now looking forward to make sure that if we, uh, in five years time, if we have another report, then the conclusion would be that those markets have become much more competitive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luc. Maybe on the point of consultation, I fully appreciate um, the fact that uh, we have between now and uh, CN1 um, a period where I think we all uh, could very much use a break and spend some time with our families. Um, the other thing is that uh, we will later uh, in this session present, have a presentation by uh, the incoming chair, uh, ETT, on the work program for next year, which uh, before consultation had uh, a record 49 uh, work items. Spoiler alert, that number will not go down, um, meaning that uh, we are pressed for time with a view of C of the first CN, um, uh, which is uh, scheduled for mid-February. So I think uh, the co-chairs have tried with their deadlines of uh, 27th of January, respectively, the 3rd of February, tried their utmost to make sure that you have the most time that they can provide for. Um, but they also have to have time to analyze your input. So I see very little room for uh, shifting any of the deadlines without getting us into trouble uh, somewhere else. Um, um, but maybe, Chiara, you have some solution. I think we have a very packed program, so I see very little room to move any of the deadlines. Chiara? Yes, concerning the deadlines, um, I mean, the only thing we can do, it was uh, under discussion as well, is uh, uh, that we can move the deadline for the NICS report to the 3rd of uh, February, uh, like the one for business services. So this is a solution. Uh, it gives one more week, which is uh, uh, not very long, but still in this case, it's, uh, every day is, uh, is precious. So this is something that we could do in this, uh, in this case. Thank you, Chiara, for that um, flexibility. And on your second question, uh, I'm sorry, that's the most we can do, um, but have given, as I said, the, the timelines for next year in general, there is no period, I think, next year where there will be a bit more room and everybody will be able to breathe and, and push in some more work. 
Um, so I think this is the maximum we can achieve. And I was wondering, your second question um, was directed to whom specifically? Uh, <laughs> I would say to the co-chairs of the business uh, user ah, working group. Great. It would be most appropriate, I think, or, or, or you or... Uh, or the incoming chair, it's... Uh, then, I'll, then I'll start yeah. with the co-chairs. Kiara, your Jorge, any reflections? Uh, perhaps I can start. First of all, thank you, Luke, because we, we know that this topic is important for you. You also raised in the, in the workshop we have, uh, we have this issue. But uh, first of all, uh, it's just to say that, I mean, it's country has its own challenges eh? and it's an array who uh, should address the specific issues taking into account the national uh, circumstances, etc. So it is not very uh, solving all the situation uh, for all Europe, but uh, our mission is more on coordination, on uh, sharing experiences, on when needed, having uh, common positions, etc. So, mm, uh, I mean, of course, in this report, you will not, you will not find the, the solution, or even proposals, agreed or whatever, because it's simply what we have tried with the reports we have prepared, uh, prepared is to collect evidence, um, to see in the future with the, with the aim of making this, um, this market more competitive on where we can learn from each other. And so we will do, but not as something saying that uh, Berek uh, thinks that everybody should do this or this is not well done in this country or other country but sharing our, our experience, experience um put it putting it in, in written and, and and discussing with the stakeholders so in, in this line i mean any a big input from you on ideas on what aspects we can that you already said eh, same as others in in, in the workshop, but uh, you have any other additional idea or whatever for the future world that uh, I could concentrate in your case in this part because other parts are more factual. I mean, this is what we have, but uh, the, the, the part on future work is especially interesting for us to hear from you. Uh, I don't know, Kiara, do you want to add anything or so? I don't know, Anne-Marie, would you like to, to add on this? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jorge. I think it is it is um, good that you underline the character of this, uh, of this report. And of course, the general assessment of the competitive situation throughout the whole of Europe is, of course, done when the Commission undertakes its assessments and thinks about um, which markets are still deemed uh, relevant every, uh, every now and then. And I think the goal of this report was was specifically to remind us all of uh, of the status of uh, of these markets, which vary uh, across uh, across Europe. Um, so uh, I can only underline uh, the fact that we have, of course, um, from market to market, uh, a case by case uh, uh, analysis. And for the Netherlands, for example, we have deregulated this market uh, since uh, since since before I can remember, but I have not been at the ACM forever. Um, so, um, um, point well taken um, in the sense that if there's any other evidence gathering we can do to assist in the um, uh, next assessment on the European level of the status of competitiveness of the uh, uh, telecom markets, then, uh, then that, of course, will be, uh, will be very happy and uh, we're, uh, we'll be cons considering that to take that on board. And I think with that, uh, that is, I think, all we can do with this question. Any other questions? Were you you were waving. Yes, please go ahead. Oh, thank you. And Hotchko, Deutsche Telekom. Um, same same topic, just by coincidence. A report on business services. So it's a question which goes uh, to us, Jorge. Uh, in our countries, we do see a very interesting trend that for a very, let's say, insignificant part of our customers, 
uh, business customers, they see increasingly the substitution in the specific tailor-made business services, which is coming from the more or less retail services. So in other words, the services which are uh, making the scope of uh, market one and not market two uh, on the retail basis. Um, that's a dynamic process. It's difficult to say uh, to which extent it's, let's say, a small or a big trend in different markets, but that's uh, exactly why I'm asking you, um, do you see this also as a trend as a result of your work? And if yes, uh, in how far you want to, uh, let's say, incorporate that as a, some potentially significant driver in uh, the next uh, work you do on this topic. And uh, just before, uh, Jorge, sorry for that, but before, before you answer, that's uh, it's not very often, but I, I think we fully side with Luke and his comment that, uh, yes, yeah, some of the deadlines, they're quite challenging and um, yeah, it's hard to challenge you, but you have a very rich agenda for next year planned, so we fully understand that you are very pressurized. But um, it's just, it, it may so happen that at some point of time, simply uh, you'll not hit the right balance, perhaps between the quality and quantity of the topics. So, and, you know, in October, we have been here listening to a very high profile report. And um, yeah, there were some voices that could have benefited from a little bit more of, you know, iterations. But uh, that was just a remark to support Luke that he's not alone in this room. And um, so, Jorge. Will be your view on my question. Okay, thank you. I mean, it's good to, to see that for one time and one actor, an actor are in the same. Now, uh, on this, just, just to, to make sure that I understood well, you are meaning a trend to use more the mass market uh, products for uh, business uses. Yes. In Instead other words, the more specialized and tailored. Uh, the retail fiber uh, is so good that they don't need any uh, super high capacity lease line because if they get like 500 megs or one gig, then it's fully sufficient for them. Yeah, I think that we haven't. This is more for the external report uh, we prepare, but it's also input received from NRAs. We don't have a specific data on this, but our idea is the same as yours. I mean, the, the, and it's part of what I was telling you about the competition dynamics, etc. Having uh, a footprint of fever higher and higher. That's simply the, the mass market services as are much better uh, than in the past. So more companies are using them. Uh, so agree, we don't have the data, the empirical data on what is the, the trend of substitution, but yes, and it's something that may also be changing the dynamics of competition and is worth uh, analyzing uh, because yes, there is a, a trend there uh, that is difficult to measure. Uh, because it's difficult to separate from one type of company to other type of company, um, etc. But yes, it's a very interesting issue, and it could be good to 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 receive if you have data or whatever in the public consultation. Please raise it uh, because it's an interesting topic. Yeah, I don't know if you would like to. Okay, so. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yes, uh, thank you for the floor. Uh, this is Oliver Fug from Telefonica Group. Um, I have a question for Julia on the report on uh, OTT uh, revenue indicators. Uh, and it's not specifically about the revenue indicator, but it is more about the overall process that Beric has been engaging in for the past couple of years already um, to promote data collection on this issue. Um, so NICs and OTTs in a wider sense, I should say. Um, and I was wondering, you presented some data um, in the report as to the planned activities of NRAs in Europe right now, but as far as is visible, um, these data seem to pertain only to um, this year and 
the beginning of next and i wanted to hear you on whether there was further information both on what nras are planning in this field and what barrick is planning in following up on the data collection effort um, itself and secondly i was also curious to hear um, whether this subject matter has been a topic of discussion as part of barrick's international collaboration thank you Julia, please. Thank you for the question. Uh, so just to, um, hopefully I understood you correctly concerning the, the first question. Um, this is just to, to highlight that BEREC as such is just uh, with this report. So also the previous work and the work that we did this year is to enable the judgment of the NRAs, but then the NRAs are the ones deciding on data collection as such. So we do provide a forum to exchange experience, to check what has been done. And as we said already, um, we noticed that in terms of NICS data collection, the NRAs are on the learning curve, if you can say so. Um, we can also mention that we found out that because we, we had a questionnaire concerning this issue and we found out just five out of 28 NRAs that answered have been engaging on concrete steps towards this. So this is quite early. And therefore, we have been writing this report so that NRAs really pick up and think about these issues deeper. But as BEREC, we are not proposing any data collection as such. So um, I hope that this answers the, the first question. Uh, and regarding international cooperation, the, the second question that you addressed to us, um, we have not discussed so far uh, with other uh, international organisms, whether we can uh, build together um, the efforts into, into data collection from NICS. Thank you for that clarification, Julia. Are there any other questions at this stage? Uh, Luc? <laughs> As I have, we'll, we'll have to leave in, in half an hour. I, I, I take the, mm -hmm. the, the opportunity to ask a question that uh, is not related to the four reports that have been presented, but might be somehow related to what you said before, and it's the impact of the energy crisis and, and, and somehow also the demand of Ukraine to have uh, generators and so on. And, and uh, uh, there they, they are there are lots of plans or discussions in many countries to, to rationalize or to, or to load sheeting plans to, uh, to, 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 to cut some industries from, uh, from supply of energy and things like that. And we, we believe there that it would be a very, very bad idea to, uh, to cut uh, telecom operators from, from, from the energy. And, and on the one hand, you have this call from Ukraine. On the other hand, you have everybody in, in Europe that is that is afraid that the the, 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 the few generators they have, they, they, they might need them to, for, for, for to maintain a little bit of their network working. And my question here is that we believe that there might be a role or at least it might be useful to have a position from Berek really calling to protect and to make sure that the telecom uh, operators are not uh, disconnected from uh, the energy provision considering the role they play in society. And there is also some risk that, the, that the, some countries might force the operators to, to assume that it's just not possible. You cannot put a generator behind uh, every antenna or everything. So that's not an option. The only option that is the good one is to make sure that the energy continue to flow, the electricity continue to flow to the operators. And I think it's a quite important debate and it's a huge debate and a position from Berek on that might be welcome. <laughs> Thank you for that um, a suggestion, Luc. Um, I think we uh, uh, we understand where it's coming, uh, where, where that's coming from, and we will consider. Uh, I will discuss with uh, with the incoming chair if we can, uh, if we can, if it will be appropriate to issue a, a statement. Uh, I don't know, but I understand very much where you're coming from, and I will not. Um, I think at the board of regulators, it was very clear from the presentation by Alexander, the head of the NCC how important it is to um, 
to make sure that you have continuity in, uh, in connectivity. And I think uh, the past years have shown that that is also important for, uh, uh, for Europe, but it's not without effort. It, is, um, it, it feels maybe like running water, and turning over, open the tap and the water comes out, but it's something that needs protecting and uh, it needs attention. So thank you very much for that remark. I'll take that on board and into consideration. If that concludes this question round, then thank you to all our co-chairs. Um, I'm not sure whether you are all aware as our stakeholders that um, uh, P4 in 2022 also marked the end of the regular two-year term for the co-chairs in uh, in Verac. That means that we already that we also had a, uh, a procedure and a decision on um, nominating new co-chairs also in the new working group structure that we have. And that means that we uh, uh, next year will also start uh, a new era, so to say. Some of the co-chairs fortunately will remain with us, which is, I think, very good for the continuity and the knowledge, know-how and context that we have. Uh, but we also will welcome um, nine new co-chairs, which I think uh, shows the uh, immense uh, interest and commitment of all our members to this uh, very important work. It also means that some of the co-chairs, also people we have seen today, will uh, will not be as actively involved in Berwick. And uh, two of those have been with us today. That is uh, Begonia uh, from CNMC and uh, Jorge. And just uh, by accident, both are from CNMC. But um, they will uh, they will uh, hopefully still be very uh, very involved in uh, in Berwick work, but in a different uh, and other role. Um, and this also goes to show that. Um, and I will repeat that at the end of uh, today's meeting, that the meet and greet um, uh, at our stakeholder forum is, uh, I think, more important than ever because you will see uh, new teams for various expert working groups. I think with that, we can go on to the second half of uh, our presentation, and that starts with the draft Barrick report on the impact of AI solutions in the telecommunications sector and regulation. Um, this is a report that would normally be presented by the two co-chairs, uh, Bert and Maria, um, but uh, they are part of a Beric delegation that is visiting Lima, Peru uh, presently. Um, and that is a visit that is um, uh, one of the results of our cooperation and our MOU that, is, um, uh, that we have closed uh, between Beric and Regulatel. Um, and because the PFT uh, items, such as uh, the development of 5G in both Latin America on the one hand and Europe on the other, is very much on the agenda, Bert and Maria are there to present our work. So that leaves uh, me, actually, to uh, as the only volunteer, um, to present in one sheet um, our work uh, draft report on the impact of AI solutions. The aim of this uh, work stream uh, by the Planning and Future uh, Tense um, Working Group was to identify the role that artificial intelligence may uh, play in the telco sector in the near future or may already have an impact uh, or should have an impact on regulation and to see how, uh, how actually in the telco uh, sector we are already seizing the opportunities of artificial intelligence. Now, the expert working group has um, has issued um, a questionnaire to all the member uh, NRAs of uh, BEREC uh, and have um, analyzed those results. They have asked for some uh, external input, but unfortunately, that input was quite limited. And they have already they have also undertaken a lot of uh, desk research on uh, all the academic papers on this subject. And from that analysis follows the main outcome. Uh, that although we all expect that in the midterm AI will be very important in the um, uh, telco sector, it is still very much at an early stage, which may explain why the um, input from, uh, from external stakeholders has been somewhat limited so far. Therefore, the report is quite descriptive at this point. We see no reason for regulatory measures at this stage. Um, however, if you feel that we have not taken all the information on board, um, please let us know in the public consultation. The deadline is extended until February the 3rd, and all contributions and exchanges will be more than welcome. Again, this is very exploratory work, uh, but that is, of course, very much in line with the character of our Planning and Future Trends Working Group, which try to stay 
um, very much at the forefront of what is happening at the interconnection of um, ICT development on the one hand and the telco sector on the other. So that is all I have to share on this report. So next we go to the Fixed Network Evolution Working Group. I think Wilhelm is online to talk about the Beric report on competition and geographical division. Wilhelm. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Also, good afternoon on behalf of the FNE Working Group. Yes, the title of the report is Beric Report on Competition Amongst Multiple Operators of NGA Networks in the Same Geographical Region. Next slide, please. Regional operators play an increasingly important role on the broadband market in many European countries. Regional, operate, the regional networks of different operators may overlap and operators may use different business strategies. Beric already published a common position on geographical aspects of market analysis in 2014 and a report on the application of this common position in 2018. This report is built on these previous BEREC activities and its objectives are to examine the extent to which multiple NJ networks are present in the same geographical area and the resulting impact on retail prices and retail product characteristics and to analyze the impact this had on the market for local wholesale access provided at fixed location. Considering both cases, where market definition and or remedies have been geographically differentiated and where this is not the case. The report is based on data collected from NRAs of 31 European countries in April this year. The findings of the report are as follows. Next slide, please. Presence of multiple NJ networks in the same geographical area. The number of NGA networks present in the same geographical area differs significantly. The area where two NGA networks are present is in many countries between 11 and 50 percent homes passed. The area where three NGA networks are present is smaller and in most of the countries up to maximum 25 percent homes passed. And the area where more than three NGA networks are present is still smaller and in most of the counties up to maximum 10% homes passed. Differences in retail prices and or retail product characteristics between different geographical areas have been investigated by 18 countries and only three of them found differences in retail prices and one of them differences in retail product characteristics. Main reasons for the differences in retail prices and or retail product characteristics do not show a clear tendency and vary between these three countries. Examples of such reasons are competition between networks, differences in the underlying access technology, and variation of wholesale prices. Seven countries have not investigated these differences. Four countries did not consider them to be relevant because they are small, only temporary, or they are traditionally regional operators. Reasons of other countries are that the country is small or that it was difficult to collect data. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Outcome of the geographical analysis in the last market analysis of the market for wholesale local access provided at a fixed location, market one of the recommendation of relevant markets 2020 or market 3A of the recommendation on relevant markets 2014. This table provides an overview on the geographical differentiation of market definition and or remedies in the 31 European countries examined. In four countries, the market analysis resulted in a deregulation and one country did never regulate this market. Six countries defined subnational geographical markets and one of them, in addition, geographically differentiated remedies in the subnational market. Five countries defined a geographical differentiation of the remedies in the national market and 15 countries did not adopt any geographical differentiation 
neither market definition nor remedies. These results show that the number of countries which geographically differentiated market definition and or remedies has significantly increased in the last four years from 7 to 11, which means by about 60%. Next slide, please. The main reasons for the geographical differentiation of market definition and or remedies are in descending order frequency as follows. Differences, geographical differences in the coverage of alternative network networks in nine countries. Geographical differences in retail market share of the incumbent. Geographical differences in wholesale share of the incumbent. Population density, which has an impact on economy of scale. Geographical differences resulting from commercial wholesale offers of alternative networks. And a few further reasons. The type of the geographic unit used in the geographic analysis in the last market analysis is in nine countries an administrative unit, for example, a municipality, in one country the postal code, and in one other country the electricity supply area. The number of resulting units, geographic units, vary significantly between less than 100 in three countries up to nearly 20,000 in one country. The criteria used for grouping the geographical units into homogeneous subnational geographical markets or areas with different remedies are number of competitors, number of competitors <coughs> with an individual infrastructure coverage above a certain threshold, Number of competitors with an individual market share above a certain threshold, market share of the incumbent below a certain threshold, and a few further criteria. Next slide, please. Fifteen countries did not adopt any geographical differentiation, neither market definition nor remedies. In most of them, in 12 countries, the presence of multiple NJ networks did not result in a sufficiently different competition. In three countries, the, the area where multiple NJ networks are present is still small or negligible. And a few further reasons. The country case studies on a particular high number of regional operators showed the following. One country, Finland, defined 150 sub-national geographical markets. However, only 21 SMP operators and all of, all of them are historical incumbents. Therefore, despite the high number of sub-national geographical markets, the situation is manageable. One other country, Denmark, defined 21 sub-national geographical markets and 10 SMP operators. It's worth noting that only one of these 10 SMP operators is the historical incumbent, and the nine other operators are alternative fiber operators, electric utility companies, which were designated as SMP operator. The number of subnational geographical markets and the number of SMP operators are also manageable. And in one further country in Sweden, BNOA has not yet adopted the geographic differentiation of market definition. However, there are indications of a particular high number of subnational geographical markets which might be burdensome to administrate. For example, in Sweden there are around 180 local fiber networks, all of, most of which are owned by municipalities. Thank you for your attention. Now I hand over to Tim and Katja, co-chairs of the Cyber Security Working Group. Okay, so I, I see uh, the slides are uh, here now. So okay, but, so thank you then for giving us uh, the opportunity present, uh, to present our report on the uh, ECA audit recommendations for 5G cybersecurity. Before going into the details, uh, we can have a look at the structure of the report. So it starts with uh, some background information about the ECA's uh, special report and their contribution uh, to the special report. This is then followed by an overview of the conclusions and recommendations formulated by the European Court of Auditors. We then have a look uh, at our relevant past activities and examine uh, potential initiatives for us to support the Commission and the NIS Cooperation Group with the implementation of the ECA's audit uh, recommendations. 
Uh, so the ECA formulated three recommendations for the Commission. The first recommendation is to promote the even and timely deployment of 5G networks within the European Union. Uh, so this is already on the next slide. Um, and so the Commission should uh, develop a common definition of the expected quality of service of 5G networks, encourage member states to include objectives for 5G deployment in their strategies and plans, and support member states in addressing spectrum coordination issues. So on the next slide, we have the second recommendation, which is to uh, foster a concerted approach to 5G security among member states. The Commission should uh, provide further guidance on the EU toolbox for 5G cybersecurity, promote transparency on the member states' approaches to 5G security, and assess the needs for specifying enforceable requirements. The third recommendation is to monitor member states' approaches towards 5G security and assess the impact of divergences uh, on the effective functioning of the single market. This is also shown on the next slide. Uh, and then the Commission should uh, promote uh, a transparent and consistent approach regarding the member states' treatment of MNOs costs uh, for replacing 5G equipment and assess the impact on the single market when in one member state equipment is used from a vendor uh, that is considered as a high-risk vendor in another member state. So Katja will uh, continue with uh, the next part. Oh, Katja, you're still on mute. Sorry, sorry, here we go. Thank you, Tim. Uh, so in chapter three, we present some of the past uh, Barrett work, which uh, may be relevant for the recommendations of the ECA. Uh, these activities are related uh, and related deliverables are listed together with a short description and uh, relevant links uh, to the documents. If we go then to the next slide. Um, I will not uh, read them all out uh, because um, uh, there are some, uh, for example, some work has already been done concerning the recommendation to uh, promote transparency on the member states approach to 5G cybersecurity and similar approach as used in the past could be reused also for further work. If we go to the next slide. Uh, same goes uh, also for the recommendation three, promote a transparent, transparent and consistent approach regarding the member states' treatment of MNO's costs for replacing 5G equipment. Uh, the revision of these past activities and some future looking uh, thinking led us then to the next chapter, which is a non-exhaustive uh, list of potential initiatives. If we go to the next slide. Uh, since we know that uh, implementation of the ECI recommendations is the responsibility of the Commission and the NIS Cooperation Group, uh, Barrett proposed some possible activities to play the supportive role here, particularly in implementing the security-related recommendations. Uh, it is a non-exhaustive list. Uh, for example, concerning recommendation two, uh, Barrett could help with proposing uh, some KPIs, for example, for SM05, uh, 06, and uh, TM5. If we go to the next slide. Uh, concerning recommendation two, uh, Barrett could help by studying any proposals made by the Commission and where relevant, also collect information from NRAs and or uh, the providers. If we go to the next slide. Uh, concerning the recommendation three, uh, Barry could examine the MNO's 5G deployment status, uh, plans, um, vendor choice, uh, the replacement cycle, for example. And if we go to the last slide, uh, all these uh, potential initiatives of BEREC will be firstly discussed and then done in close cooperation with the Commission and the NIS Cooperation Group. And they all sit well as well in our work program for 2023. Uh, the report uh, was uh, published on BEREC website on December 12th. Now I give the floor to Kustas uh, Masilos BEREC Chair 2023. Thank you. Thank you, Katya. Uh, good afternoon from my side as well. Um, I'm happy to present today the final Berwick Work Programme 2023. 
Unfortunately, due to other commitments, I cannot participate physically, but I will be available to answer any questions you might have uh, on Work Programme 2023. Next slide, please. Uh, so, maybe you remember we started uh, eight months ago in April uh, 2022 uh, and we published an initial call for input for our work program and using this input as well as taking into account uh, the regulatory framework and our members' preferences, we prepared the draft work program 2023 for which we had the public consultation in October and November, so it was launched following Plenary 3 meeting in, in October. Uh, we received 18 contributions and on the basis of this we made some slight changes. I will discuss these changes in the next slide. During our last Plenary, last week, we adopted the final work program 2023 and the relevant consultation report. Both documents are of course available in Berex website. Next, next slide, please. Now, um, with regards to the comments, the main comments we received, some, some stakeholders commented that the IP interconnection ecosystem assessment is a broader topic than the one we have included in our draft work program. Taking into account this comment, as well as the available information about the next steps of the European Commission, uh, we are proposing to have two separate items in the work program. So one for the response to the public consultation that will be launched by the European Commission and a separate report on IP interconnection ecosystem. Uh, some participants requested uh, more consultations with stakeholders for the topics not already foreseen. Therefore, we have included workshops for both studies uh, we will run in 2023 and we have already launched a call for input for the roaming tasks that are due to uh, Q1 2023. We also did some minor editing changes on uh, wireless network evolution items, uh, data act work item uh, with regards to timing and the cloud report. Finally, uh, as the topics of the access recommendation and the broadband cost reduction directive review are expected from the Commission during 2023. We included uh, these two as separate subsections under the section on ad hoc BEREC work. Next slide, please. So, summing up, we have finally reached 51 items, which is quite a lot, but we believe that thanks to BEREC's experts, we will have a successful delivery. Uh, next slide, please. Another topic I would like to, to, to discuss is uh, with regards to some changes in the structure of our working groups. In particular, we renamed the 5G Cybersecurity Working Group to Cybersecurity, as we understand that BEREC needs to have a broader perspective on cybersecurity topic. Uh, we merged our Remedies Working Group with the Statistics and Indicators Working Group. The name of the new working group is Remedies and Market Monitoring. And we created an additional working group for digital markets in line with our second key strategic priority. Uh, this new working group will further enhance our contribution on digital matters. Um, in addition, as the previous term of our co-chairs has expired, we reappointed 15 co-chairs. Uh, we pre pre proceeded with an internal transfer and selected eight new co-chairs and our new team represents 17 different NRAs and exhibits a very good gender balance. Next slide, please. Last but not least, I would like to give you a heads up about the next BEREC Stakeholders Forum. It will take place on March 30, 2023 in Brussels. And we will, we will continue with the same format, which means having meet and greet sessions with our co-chairs in the morning and the conference in the afternoon. We look forward to seeing you all in our forum in March. And I think with this, um, that's all from me about 2023, um, I will remain connected to, to respond to any questions you might have uh, during the Q&A session.
Uh, thank you, and I would like to pass the floor to Anne-Marie. Thank you. Thank you, Costas. I think we have now two sheets on our BEREC updates. One, as I said, we had a visit from my, our colleague from NCC, and we took that opportunity to sign the working arrangements so that we have now finalized our, um, uh, their, their accession to BEREC as a participant without voting rights. Um, so we were able to finalize that in a record time. And then my next sheet will be on the public consultations, uh, of which we just learned that the second in line, the draft report on interoperability of the NICS can also be shifted to February 3, um, giving all of you, I think, almost four working weeks as we started, we published these reports on December. 12, but we will take into account the fact uh, for next year that um, we should take um, into account the Christmas uh, and New Year's period um, and make sure that we give all of you enough time to relax. I think with that, I have about said everything we needed to say other than um, you may be aware that being a barrack chair uh, also involves having a real hammer, which I transferred um, successfully towards um, Costas. I assume, Costas, you do not have it with you to show everybody that you actually received the hammer in good order. I am, uh, however, happy that we can transfer um, the chairmanship so smoothly um, and uh, to underline the fact that I think uh, the continuity and the carryovers and the priorities um, hopefully make for a very smooth transition um, from one chair to another. And I will concentrate my contribution to uh, the outgoing chair tasks um, next year and looking forward to being part of Costas's mini board. I think that kind of sums up everything we had to share at P4. Are there any questions on the second half of our presentations? Yes, please. Hi, good afternoon. Manuel Braga, Montego Vodafone Group. Um, it's a one comment and one question. Uh, the comment is to thank uh, Begonia and Jorge for, for their work and good collaboration. I remember long discussions with Begonia on, on the Article 22 of the code, homes passed, homes connected, greed, size of greed, etc. So thank you very much. I hope to see you soon and not... Uh, a goodbye. Um, and related to, to that, I, then I have a question. It's not on this particular, uh, on, on P4, but the state aid guidelines were adopted uh, on Monday by the European Commission. I'm aware that it's very soon uh, to, to have a, a view, but it's only to, to know if you've made a, a brief assessment already on what is now in the annex on mapping and new rules and new uh, tasks for the NRAs, if you have already a, a, a brief uh, feedback on, on that or if we should wait, and I'm happy to wait as well, but just wanted to, to ask this question. Thank you. I will first look at the MIA co-chairs and then the SNE co-chairs for your question on the state aid guidelines and the mapping. Jorge and Chiara, have you already had a chance to look at the state aid guidelines or am I looking at completely the wrong people? It's on F&E, right? Yeah. yeah, sorry, sorry, Chiara. Wilhelm, have you had a chance to look at the state aid Thank guidelines? Thank you for this question, of course, they are very interesting. In this topic, unfortunately, I only received the information last, yes, yesterday afternoon, so it was not really good possible to have a more close look in the new stated guidelines. But I would like to remember that uh, Beric uh, very extensively contributed to the public consultation on the draft revised guidelines, so our position should be rather clear and we will have to see how much have been taken on board uh, in, in the guidelines. Thank you. And on the mapping, because I remember now, Wilhelm, that we had a, a, um, 
uh, a collab in this uh, this regard from uh, from the uh, fixed network yeah. evolution with mm -hmm. on the mapping specifically the SNE. Um, and uh, but just just before I give you the floor, Julia and Begonia, any first uh, impressions already, or have you had time to have a look? I'm afraid that I'm in the same situation as Willem. This is sitting in my computer. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Please. Now, in any case, I think that our situation is similar, but in any case, in Beric, we will uh, study and see how we collaborate among different groups. So, perhaps it's too early uh, for us. Yes, so, uh, Marit Palovita from Etno. Uh, hello to everybody. Just a question to Costas. You mentioned that you will be putting the um, access recommendation alongside the new broadband cost reduction uh, directive as an ad hoc item into next year's work program. And I'm just wondering, um, I think uh, based on previous discussions with the European Commission, there was due to be a Beric opinion on the draft uh, recommendation. Is this something that has been already concluded or is it then happening next year? Because I know that there were some delays uh, on the European Commission side on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marit. Uh, I think the workforce in for next year is an analysis for BCRD when, when it comes and if the time frame allows and this will be Submit, would be submitted to co-legislators. And for access recommendation, indeed, it's going to be an opinion. Okay, thank you, Claire. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Yeah, this is Pinar Sardangesh from ECTA and following up uh, with Mart's question. So this means that uh, you still did not receive the uh, opinion request from the Commission because the last time that we met each other, uh, there was this explicit question from our side and uh, the answer was no, so we can assume that the answer is still no. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think yes, the answer is no. <laughs> your assumption is correct, I would say. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, we continue. Yes, please. Hello, good afternoon. Um, it's Rod Kerwan from Meta. Um, I'd like to ask a question about the 23 work program, please. Um, in particular, the IP in interconnection um, ecosystem and the decision to split it into two work streams. Um, could I just check first of all that the two work streams will be delivered separately, different timing, um, and, and if that's the case then could you comment perhaps on the scope of each work stream and how they interact? Um, I'm particularly thinking that I, you know, uh, work stream one probably informs work stream two and if they're running separately how do you plan to ensure, you know, uh, rich inputs for Workstream 2. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, indeed, there are two, two different work streams from now on. Originally, we had one on the IP interconnection ecosystem. So we continue the work on IP interconnection ecosystem, and this will lead to a report in end of 2023 to be published for consultation. This is one work stream. The, the, the second work stream will is more ad hoc i would say because it will include our work to respond to european commission's consultation what they have announced we do not know more information about the content of the consultation and the exact timing so this will be adapted to what european commission will announce so i would see of course there might be overlaps in, in the content, but these are two work streams that will run in parallel. Thank you. Kostas, I have one question that we have not addressed yet uh, online. That is from Tony Shortall. It's a question, Wilhelm, for you. Is the objective of the report to encourage a common approach to geographic differentiation? Wilhelm? Yes, uh, thank you for this question. As mentioned in the presentation, the report 
is an analysis of what has happened in the member states with regard to the presence of multiple NGA networks in the same region. Due to the fiber rollout, this is increasingly uh, important. And a result is presented is that more and more NOAs will have a situation that they will geographically differentiate market definition and remedies. This uh, document is not a document on a common approach or on best practices. It's just a report. Yes. So there may be considered a follow up in 2024 or whatever, but this still, of course, needs to be cited um, during the preparation of the future work programs. Thank you, Wilhelm. Are there any other questions? At this stage. <coughs> no? Then I hereby conclude this meeting on our very last slide is I say goodbye to you now as Beric Chair. We do as Beric hope to see you uh, soon. Uh, first is our next Beric, bub uh, Beric public debriefing on May 15, which is virtual. Um, that is our public, uh, our uh, Beric meeting will be virtual. I'm not sure about the public debrief, where it will be also yeah. only virtual. Okay, so the f our first meetings are all virtual. Our first CN is virtual, our first plenary is virtual, and our first public debriefing will also be virtual. This limits our CO2 footprint enormously, so we have decided to do everything in March virtually. So see you online on March 15. And then our first physical meeting is uh, at the Stakeholder Forum on March 30. Uh, it will be organized in Brussels and information on the program will uh, follow as soon as possible. Thank you all for your attention. I wish you a lovely end of the year and hope to see you again in March.